But praise the Lord, saints. I'm Elder Marvin Kelly. It's my pleasure to uh, host the Wednesday Night Family Bible Study here at the Well Community Church. It's an exciting time we're living in. And I'm so pleased to be able to break the bread of life before you as we go live, being broadcasted. Get your Bible, get your uh, paper, a pen, as you uh, get ready to go into the Word and take some notes. But first, let's go to the throne of grace and prayer. Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we come and gather at this place, this house of prayer, seeking your face and calling on your name. Your servant decreases, Lord God, that you might increase. I empty out that you might fill me up. I pray the Holy Spirit will stir up the word and bring it forth as rivers of living water. And I pray those who are viewing, Lord God, would receive the word and that it may refresh their hungry souls, that they may be strengthened within their inner man, that Christ Jesus, body of Christ, rather, may be edified as we go forth. Now, Lord, set upon them, give them ears to hear, the heart to receive, and the willingness to do your word. And may it bring forth fruit in abundance. Yes, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening. Well, we begin in the study of gospel according to Mark. Mark's gospel is the second of the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, uh, some uh, background on the gospel of Mark. It was written by Mark, John Mark, uh, Barnabas' uh, nephew. At around about circa uh, A.D. 68. Many theologians believe that the Gospel of Mark reflects uh, Simon Peter's view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is a surmise based on uh, Peter's reference to John Mark in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Although Mark isn't mentioned uh, by name in the Gospels, he is mentioned in the book of Acts. For John Mark had his beginning in ministry with his uncle Barnabas. And he uh, joined Apostle Paul on the first uh, uh, evangelistic ministry of Apostle Paul. And something occurred that caused a great rift. And John Mark uh, returned from that uh, missionary journey. And when Barnabas wanted them uh, to go back on the second, he invited uh, Mark to return and Paul wasn't having any of that and so this rift caused uh, Barnabas and Paul to separate and as we know from reading the book of Acts Barnabas and Mark uh, took up the gospel and Paul and Silas uh, went forth preaching the gospel the other thing about Mark is that uh, his mother's name is mentioned in the gospel his mother's name is Mary the father's name is pretty much unknown there's no biblical citation of Mark's father it is believed also by theologians that Mark's gospel was written primarily for the Roman audience. And as such, we see that Mark uh, frames the Lord Jesus Christ and speaks primarily of his servanthood. And he refers to him as the servant of God. And he accomplishes some very specific works for God the Father. An interesting fact about the gospel of Mark is the frequent use of the word immediately. It speaks of a sense of urgency. It speaks of uh, no time being wasted. And at the rapid pace of Mark can be observed in the fact that it's the shortest of the four Gospels. In these 16 chapters, we see the focus is on the preaching of the Gospel, the healing of the sick, and the casting of the demons, and the preaching of the Gospel of the Kingdom of God, the Gospel of Repentance. So without any further ado, let's go into the word. Join me now at chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger uh, before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. What we see here is a reference to John the Baptist, who was ordained of God and really chosen and elected by God the Father to be the forerunner, the one to come along and herald the coming of the king. God had not spoken to the children of Israel, for there had not been any open prophecy, nor prophets on the scene for some 400 years. And so, if you will, God had put Israel on time out. And they had experienced a spiritual drought and spiritual famine, for God had not spoken to them since the close of the book of Malachi. 
And Malachi is the one who uh, states, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I can imagine that the saints of God, the Hebrews, were thinking maybe uh, this one that is, uh, God is going to send, maybe he'll come you know, in uh, a year or two, maybe a decade, maybe 50 years. Uh, but as time progressed, uh, that forerunner did not come on the scene. It took, again, as I said, some 400 years before God broke his silence and sent forth his messenger, John the Baptist. We see that this was prophesied not only in Malachi, but also in Isaiah. And for those of you who like to uh, look closer at it, you'll see it in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. We see also in the Matthew, uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 15, where the Lord Jesus Christ says that John has come in the spirit and power of Elijah. So I tell you something. John's coming was no accident, no coincidence, but it's by divine appointment. And your viewing and watching this broadcast is not an accident, no coincidence, but it's also by divine appointment. Though we had planned to broadcast this uh, live on Wednesday night, we have some technical difficulties. But I want you to know, the word of God is still going forth. Amen? Hallelujah. Somebody give God some glory. Verse 4, it says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remissions of sin. Think about it. As I said, it had been 400 years since God spoke to his uh, children, his chosen elect people. And over that time period, sin had crept in. I mean, you know, sometimes we are not hearing from God or seeking God's face. You have a tendency to backslide. Well, God says, I'm sending a messenger, a, a strong voice, one crying out in the wilderness. As you know, the scripture says John preached his gospel and his baptism of repentance in the wilderness. God has sanctified him, had taken him away from the mainstream religion out of Jerusalem. And John was preaching uh, near the Jordan River where there was much water. So people had heard there had been a story that God has broken his silence and he has sent forth one named John the Baptist. And they went out to see what does this man of God have to say. And let's find out just what he has to say. It says in verse 5, Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Oh, they knew they had a problem. They kind of figured it out after a while. You know, maybe after 10, 15, 20 years, and maybe in, after generations had died off and there was no prophetic word coming forth, they might have figured out that maybe we might have a sin problem. And, you know, people today still have a sin problem. But I want you to know the gospel is still available to you, and the Lord Jesus Christ stands ready to receive you if you are willing to confess your sins and be restored. Verse 6. It says, now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. John had a peculiar diet. I mean, I'm not going to camp out uh, and dwell on this, but uh, it's not uncommon, though, even though we might go, Ugh, you know, he's eating locusts. This was a, a part of the diet uh, for, for uh, Jews, and John uh, made his, he wasn't a meat eater. He ate locusts and wild honey. It's quite the diet. But we'll see here that uh, it is said here in verse 6 that he was clothed in camel's hair. And that's the same way that Elijah was dressed. And we'll see in a moment that John was described as coming in the spirit and power of Elijah, uh, the prophet of God who was taken away in a whirlwind and with a, the fire, the, tri, the uh, fiery chariot in 2 Kings. It says here in verse 7, and he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. John is saying that I am only simply baptizing you and cleansing you and preparing the way uh, for you to really be in the presence of the king. My baptism is one a ceremony of cleansing you from the many sins that have clung to you since you've been walking uh, without the fear of God. And so he's saying that before you get into the presence of the king, before you even attempt to uh, enter into his presence, he's saying you must be baptized 
And so John is saying, baptizing you unto repentance. Pre prepare your way for the coming of the king. But he says, there is another baptism. And that baptism is of the Holy Spirit. And what he's talking about is when we are baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, this is good stuff. Verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, I want to say this because we were, as I was saying a moment ago, that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, uh, of turning from sin. The Lord Jesus Christ was sinless. He never sinned, and there was never any sin found in him. He was a perfect son, sinless. But what this represents is Jesus honoring John's baptism and validating his mission and so that uh, there would be no doubt that he was truly sent from God to do this uh, divine work of preparing the people for the receiving of their king. And so don't get it twisted. Jesus didn't need to be baptized uh, for repentance of sin because he never did sin. This was uh, a validation of the ministry of John. Verse 10. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. I need to really exegesis this verse because Mark's gospel is so swift. He doesn't go into a lot of detail. So, but he does use some very powerful words. And what bears mentioning, even though my translation, which is a New King James uh, translation, uses the word heaven's parting, what it really says in the Greek is that heavens were rent. Uh, God peeled back the heavens from the third heavens, the uppermost heavens of God's dwelling place. And observe this action. We see heaven meeting earth. We see God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bursting on the scene. Oh, I, 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 let me paint this picture. First of all, we see John the Baptist coming on the scene, preparing the way, making the high places low, the rough places smooth, and the, uh, lowering the mountains. Hallelujah. And now that he's cleared away the brush, he, it's like he's taken away, he's taken a spiritual weed eater and cleared the paths so that the soon coming king would have a free path to come upon the scene. Oh, do you see the picture? Yes, John is clearing away the rubble that has set into their lives. He's clearing away the debris that they may see and hear and receive the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so now we see after Jesus comes on the scene and honors John by allowing John to baptize him in the Jordan, we see God also manifesting himself on the scene here in verse 10 where Mark uses the word immediately coming, from, uh, coming up from the water. He saw the heavens rent or being torn open and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do you not realize that what you see here, what we have recorded here in the gospel of Mark, is the presence of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, all at one time. And yes, we see John declaring that the king is coming soon. But what's better than John making that declaration, what's better than John being the herald that prepared the people for the soon coming king, is once the king comes on the scene, we see the father come along. That's my boy. Yeah, that's my son, who being in, in the form of God, thought it not robbery to equal with God, but humbled himself and came down as a servant of the Most High God. Oh, man, I'm trying to paint this picture. I want to give you some watercolors to see the power of God breaking on the scene. You know, it's mighty, it's powerful, it's burst on the scene with the brightness of the divine presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We see here the Holy Spirit descending upon the Lord Jesus Christ in the, uh, as in the likeness of a dove. Oh, the Prince of Peace. That's what that dove symbolizes, the Prince of Peace here on earth. You know, in, in my Bible, uh, the words of Jesus are written in red and uh, to, to signify that these are the divine words. And if I had the ability, if I had to pen, I would write these words here where we see in verse 11, you are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. I write those words in gold. But these are the priceless, precious words of God the Father declaring, that's my son. I'm very well pleased in him. It really doesn't quite capture uh, the praise that the Father is heaping upon his son. But suffice it to say, he only said it concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
moving right along. Jesus has now been baptized and he came up out of it, uh, the water and the Holy Spirit had descended upon him. But this other important note, even though uh, the, the Bible here uses the word uh, descending upon him, the Greek and the actual truth is into him. He, he was not just anointed externally, but he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Just like John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit, as we see in the Gospel of Luke. The Lord Jesus Christ was filled with the Holy Spirit, and there was an anointed also upon him, you know, without measure is what the Scripture says. For uh, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, for it pleased the Father that in him should dwell the fullness. Amen. I just want to give you the, the main essence, even though uh, this particular passage uh, uh, omits that key word using upon, it's really into. Amen. Verse 12. Now, we, we're, this gospel is a fast-moving gospel. And I'm going to slow myself down because I tend to talk fast, as y'all know. But, and, and so now we see a transition taking place. Jesus has been baptized. He's come up out of the water. The Father has declared his pleasure in, in his Son. And we see here in verse 12. Immediately, once again, this word is used some 30 more times. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Even though Mark only dedicates two verses to this, whereas Mar uh, Matthew de uh, dedicates even more, uh, there's a significant word here again that bears uh, expounding upon. And that's here in verse 12 where it says, Immediately the Spirit drove him. This is a powerful word. For it means the spirit took complete control of the Lord Jesus Christ and just brought him into a desert place, into a deserted place uh, to be tested. Oh, my God, I hope you can see this picture. He was taken from the Jordan, having been out in uh, the area where it's not really highly populated, in the area where John is baptizing, because he baptized in the wilderness. Now Jesus is being sanctified even more to be tempted of the devil. And the thing about it, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And you might say, why? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked. It's very much like, and I'm going to use uh, an analogy that, uh, 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 please allow me. Uh, when, when the Navy builds battleships, uh, like aircraft carriers or destroyers or frigates, you know, they, they load them up with all kinds of uh, sophisticated weaponry and sophisticated electronics, and they train the crew on how to operate and to navigate and to man those positions. But before they get it into service, they put it on sea trials. They put it out to sea, and they put all the systems to the test. And they stress the system to see if it's ready for real duty. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was subjected to a serious stress test. Oh, come on, stay with me now, y'all. God said, yeah, that's my boy, but I'm going to stress test him. Oh, before he gets to work, before he starts doing any ministry, he's going to be put to a test. Oh, hallelujah. I hope you see this thing. He's in the wilderness. And where it says here, with wild beasts, a desert place, he's all alone. And he's subjected for 40 days and 40 nights. And it is written in the gospel, he did not eat or drink any water under this stress test. Oh, my God. My God. He's proving the son's legitimacy. He's certifying his son. Just like those naval ships that I'm talking about, when they're sent out to the waters uh, to perform, to see if the systems will work according to design, God said, I'm subjecting my son to the pressure test. Oh, hallelujah. Sometimes we talk about things like that when uh, I'm putting the presence of some of my friends and we say, uh, pressure will burst your pipes. Because you know, we want to see what your pipes are rated for. But I want you to know, Jesus is rated and, and certified for high pressure and high temperatures. Praise God. <laughs> Let me get back to this word. Mm. So he was driven, he was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be pressure tested by the devil. And I want you to know, God can keep you. This is nothing new for God to demonstrate his ability to keep you. Moses was, was kept by God when he was on Mount Sinai with God for 40 days and 40 nights when Moses didn't eat anything or drink anything. So it ain't nothing new, but Moses wasn't tempted by the devil like Jesus was, hallelujah. Moses was in the presence of God, and God was keeping him. Oh, but we can see here that God's still able. Oh, hallelujah. God is able. Yes, he is. And verse 13 says, And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And 
was with the wild beasts. There was jackals and there were snakes and hyenas and, and lions, all kind of creatures. Oh, but they knew the master. They, they knew not to touch God's anointed and do him no harm. And if by chance uh, uh, Satan would try to do him harm, it tells us that there were angels ministering to him. Hallelujah. You know, and as I was studying this word, I got to thinking about how we have been sheltering in place uh, for some 90 plus days. And some of you are probably ready to lose your mind. But I want you to know, you're not alone. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ had angels ministering to him, when you call on him or when you just really get into God's presence, you'll discover that there's angels watching over you. And if they're an angel, I know this, I can guarantee you the Holy Spirit. If you are God's like if you're born again, the Holy Spirit is there to comfort you, to keep you, to enable you to endure this pressure test that you're probably experiencing. Hang on. Don't faint. Don't give up. Don't throw in a towel. You know, if things get a little tough, reach out to the church. The number's on the screen. Call on us. Hey, we're here to serve you. Because as you know, the church is an essential ministry. It's an essential service. And so we're standing by. We're available. The information's on your screen. Oh, don't you faint. Don't you give up. We're here to minister. And so, as we see, it's rapidly moving. So the Lord's been baptized, and he's been pressure tested by the devil uh, for 40 days and 40 nights without water or without food, just the presence of God and angels. And now his ministry is about to shift. He's endured and passed his sea trials. He's uh, passed uh, the proving, and he's legit. He's certified, uh, ready for ministry. As you can see, he didn't just go into ministry. He had to be proven. So the, the chapter now transitions from being tempted by the devil to the beginning of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us read verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. In another gospel, we see where John says, I must decrease that he may increase. John was a major light on the scene because he was prepared by God to come forth and prepare uh, the people's hearts and minds to receive the king. But now that Jesus is on the scene, uh, the brighter light must have the center stage. Uh, John was the opening act, but Jesus is the central act. And God the Father, by his providence, has chosen to take John off the scene. And you know from reading the Gospels that John was imprisoned and later on beheaded. But we don't question what God has chosen to do. Amen? But we know that John is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So you know, John preached repentance. Now Jesus says, The kingdom of God is available. And saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You notice how the message hasn't changed. And even in this day and age, people are tempted in Persian folk to change the message. But the message hasn't changed. The message is still the same. Just as John was preaching repentance in the wilderness, the Lord Jesus Christ came on the scene, got baptized, took the baton, and came preaching the same gospel message. Repent. Turn back to God. For the kingdom of God is at hand. It's close. It's near. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. And you might be sitting there right now and the Holy Spirit may be plowing or tilling your heart saying you need to be saved. Now I don't want you to squander this opportunity. You know, I want you to reach out and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Just as this gospel is a rapid, fast meeting, I don't want you to ponder it or think about it too long. Immediately reach out to the church. Verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately, they immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further uh, from there, he saw James and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately... Uh, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the higher servants and went after him. You see, God wants you to respond. When you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the provocation of the wilderness and didn't enter into God's rest. 
And I know the Holy Spirit is stirring you right now because I feel it in my spirit. And I don't want you to, to wonder and to postulate, do I need to be saved or maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised. You have this moment. In this present moment, the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart string. Repent and receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart. But look at here. These four men that the Lord Jesus Christ has called, the first four in his ministry, were, first of all, they were actively working. Uh, they, they were humble men. They weren't educated. They were fishermen. They were, they were humble servants. But it's notable that they were once John's disciples. They had been following uh, along with John the Baptist, and he had been telling them, someday the king is coming. Behold the Lamb of God. And so they had been waiting patiently for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When John said, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, they transitioned from John the Baptist to the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were anticipating the coming of the Savior. And so when he came calling them, they immediately left their vocation and took up becoming advocates for the kingdom of God. I need to say that one more time. They be left their vocation as fishermen. And they did not say, well, let me first... Uh, close the books on the business and let me sell off. No, they left it. And this is an indication of their commitment to their calling. Many of you have a commitment. But sometimes when we hear and recognize our calling, we wonder maybe I can do this and do that. Okay, but there is a calling of God that demands a lot of you. And I, I can, you know, just step into Pastor Kaufman's shoes for a brief moment when God stirred him and spoke unto his heart, to his inner man, and said, retire from football. I have a new uh, vocation. I, have a, I want you to be an advocate. I want you to advocate for the kingdom of God. Mm. Amen? Mm. Oh, this is really good stuff. And so they immediately uh, left uh, their vocation as fishermen. And what we can get from this, we see that... Uh, this wasn't a small operation. They were hired servants also. And, and the, the boat was of a sizable size. <coughs> and, and they left it all. They left it all to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you hanging on that's keeping you from following the Lord Jesus Christ? Has God told you to immediately leave something behind and follow him? He has good things for you. He has promises for you. He has blessings for you. And you and I, there are times when God will call us to leave behind something. And between our saying yes and amen, sometimes we get to debating, well, maybe, maybe I didn't hear God. Maybe that wasn't God. I want you to pray about that and respond to the calling that's on your life. Verse 21. Now, as uh, this gospel uh, progresses, we see that the Lord has began his ministry. He's recruiting uh, his uh, team. He's got James and John, and, and he has uh, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. And he begins his work. And there are three things I want to bring to your attention that are, are quite apparent in the Gospel of Mark. One, Jesus preach, preaches the kingdom of God. Two, he comes healing uh, the, those who are sick and afflicted. And three, he's cleaning house. He's casting out demons. Amen. Let's take a look at verse 21. Then they went, then they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered... Uh, the synagogue and taught and they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes this word this word astonished means they were they were just blown away they were just amazed they were it was a mixture of fear and amazement uh, they were stupefied by the way he spoke because he didn't speak like the other teachers the scribes he spoke as one having authority and why not he is the living word of God Verse 23, now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? 
but with authority he commands even unclean spirits and they obey him and immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee man I want you to see this thing Jesus I told you Mark's gospel is talking about being a servant on a mission on an assignment for those of you who are familiar with the gospel you know that in Luke's gospel chapter uh, 1 uh, Jesus talks about don't you know I must be about my father's business and Jesus was eager to enter into the family business that's in uh, Luke chapter 2 verse 49 he says I got to be about my father's business but Jesus was 12 years old he was jumping the gun his mom said come on son son uh, no 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 it's not your time but you know Jesus humbled himself but what we see now when the time came he couldn't wait to get busy doing the, the work of the father and that work was preaching the kingdom of God that work was preaching repentance turn from your wicked way turn back to God you know you know you're tired no you know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired turn back to God yeah I'm talking to you yes that's why you've tuned in don't you touch that knob don't you turn it off either don't you go doing something else you stay put because this word is for you it's for the family God wants all of us to turn back to him I suspect that's why we're all on time out sheltering in place because God wants our undivided attention that's why he's canceled all the sports. That's why he's canceled all the new TV shows. God has canceled everything and made available for you and I to enter into his presence, to hear word. Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I tell you, you know, if y'all know me, you know, it's a hard time, a hard thing for me to sit still and teach. But it's kind of like when Mary uh, was sitting at Jesus' feet, hearing his word, and, and Martha was busy uh, cooking and serving. And she came to Jesus and said, Master, you care not that uh, Mary has forsaken me? And Jesus said, Martha, Martha. You are careful to talk about many things, but one thing is, is necessary. And that good thing, Mary's chosen, which will not be taken from her. And the word of God says she sat at Jesus' feet, hearing his word. So you stay put and hear this word. Amen. And so he says, uh, he, he encounters a demon. And we see the demon was in the church, but the scribes had no power. They had no authority. And so they were content with having a devil in the church. The devil was in the synagogue. But they couldn't do nothing about it. I want you to see that. But that was part of Jesus' mission, to cast the devil out. And we're still casting demons out. And you too can be cleansed. You too can be set free from whatever yoke the enemy has bound you with. That you might be able to lift up holy hands in the presence of the Lord. That you might be able to dance free and come free from the bondage. So I tell you, the Holy Spirit is still doing a job of delivering God's people from bondage. He's still cleaning house. Hallelujah. Now, I told you this was a, a powerful message. Amen. But look, check this out. That demon comes in, uh, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus wasn't having none of that. He told, he put a muzzle on the demon. That's what it says here in the Greek when he says, shut, that's equivalent to putting a muzzle on, hush up, and shut your mouth. You, ain't, you don't have uh, authorization to speak, not in my presence. And then he says, be quiet, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him, and, and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. So this demon didn't want to come out, but it took the Lord Jesus Christ with power to say, get out. He did it with a word. Oh, I tell you, that's the power of the word of God. He didn't have to get anything other than to declare it, ram a word to cast that demon out. Amen, that's right. Mm. Verse 27, then they were all amazed. Again, this word, I say, stupefied. They're like, and frightened because they had never seen it like this before they knew the man was misbehaving with an unclean spirit but finally someone come in and come on the scene to do something about it and you know they might not have been all that you know righteous himself and so when they saw what jesus did with the word they were amazed and and I, so i looked this word up they were also stupefied mm. and so they questioned among themselves you can't see him man what's going on here man on. we ain't never seen it like this before mm. What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately, his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Amen. So it was noise abroad that, hey, there's a prophet, there's a, a, a priest, and, and there's a, a, a minister on the scene. It's the king. Verse 29. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John but Simon's wife's mother lay sick 
with a fever, and they told him about her at once. That's, that's again immediately, okay? So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. This con these three condensed verses speak of the power of Jesus and the, and the mission-oriented nature of the ministry of Jesus. Uh, in the Greek, what it's really saying here is that Peter's mother-in-law was extremely sick, ran in a high fever, most likely for days. Who knows, in, potentially near death. But they, they heard and saw what Jesus could do and immediately called him uh, to come and see about uh, Peter's mother-in-law. And we see that he did at once, and all he had to do was touch her. And he rebuked that fever and commanded the fever to be lifted from her. And immediately we see that when she was risen from her bed of affliction, when she was free from that burning fever, she began to serve. How many of you in your healthy bodies and your healthy minds are free to serve but are constrained by things that aren't nearly as important? But yet when Jesus uh, touched her, she arose from her bed of affliction and she began to serve. Yes, there's, there's a calling in this word and it's a calling for you and me to serve the Lord. Verse 32, and we speak of more uh, healing and more preaching. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. I told you he came with a, a three singular focus, preaching repentance, healing the sick, and casting out some devil. He has some house cleaning to do. He is putting out the devil so that he can uh, clean up those who were soiled by sin. Mm, man, this is good stuff. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Here you see it. Y'all see it. You see it, Peter's humble home, you know. And we see Peter, his wife, his mother-in-law, James, John, and Andrew, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the multitude throwing the door, pressing, can I get a touch? We see in the other gospel where somebody told Peter's roof up. Yeah, they did. It's in the gospel. I can't recall which one it is right now. But they tore the roof off and lowered the man down into the presence of Jesus. And born of four, it says, four folk let the man down who's paralytic. And Jesus, seeing their faith, says, thy sins be forgiven. Oh, I'm trying to tell you something about Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. Yes, Lord. And even though the sun had gone down, the people said, look, I don't know how long he's going to be in town, but I got to get my sick self. I got to get that sick loved one. I got to get my sick friend to Jesus. And some of you have sick friends, friends who are sick of sin. And you need to invite them to the broadcast. And when the doors of the church are back open again, you need to invite them into the sanctuary, back into the house of prayer to get them even closer to Jesus. But in the meantime, this will have to do. It says the whole city was gathered together at the door. Oh, that's a lovely picture of people that are hungry for God. Are you hungry for the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you desiring the presence of the Lord? Are you desiring to be delivered? Are you desiring a touch? Hmm. Verse 34, then, they, then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Oh, yeah, they knew him because he's larger than charge. They knew, they knew him when he cast them out of heaven. Oh, yeah, they know him. But he don't want no demon praising him. They're going to have to bow before him before they go into purgatory, into the lake of fire forever and ever. That's why this demon asks, have you come to destroy us? Have you come? Uh, are we out of time? Are we? Is, has, is the time up? Are you going to cast us in the lake of fire? He didn't answer. He said, shut up and come out. Verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. Now we're seeing something that up here to now hadn't been mentioned. Jesus' prayer life. And again, this is a significant part of the power of Jesus. And in his uh, connection with the Father. Here, when it's saying, it rise up early, he got up from bed somewhere in the fourth hour, somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. to go into a solitary place. He slipped away. You know, he, he slowly got up, quietly got up, exited the home, and went out to spend some quality time with the Father. And this is so significant. I really, really, really want to make this point that in our lives, we have been so busy that we didn't have a whole lot of time for God. We didn't, make, we didn't make the time to converse with God, you know. And 
you don't always have a problem, but sometimes you just want to be into the presence of God and say, thank you, Jesus, you know, for new mercies and new compassions, for your Lord's mercies and new every morning. You want to get into it, because I want to encourage you, during this time of COVID-19, this time that God has instituted, is sheltering in place, that so you can draw nearer to him, to develop some better habits, to develop some good habits, to sanctify the better part of, of the morning so that you can have some genuine quality prayer time with God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ who is our intercessor. I can't overemphasize the importance of this. And again, I truly believe that this is one of the main reasons that God has shut down the whole world because those that know him haven't made time for him. And I frequently talk to people about this. How are you spending your day? God has invested in each and every one of us the same amount, 24 hours. And I wonder, how are you spending yours? Prior to COVID, some of us spent it by going to uh, the movies, going on vacations, or going to the soccer game, or going to the football game, or taking our kids out for soccer, taking our kids out for baseball, on Sunday, on the Lord's Day. And so we kind of gave God uh, some secondhand worship, if at all. Uh, Lisa already mentioned, what is your prayer life? You know, you might be a little, you know, uh, anxious right about now, but maybe it's a good thing. You might want to examine what is your prayer life like. And so Simon Peter uh, says here in verse 36, And Simon and those who were with him, search for him. Have you been searching for Jesus? If you seek him, you'll find him. If you knock, he'll open the door to you. And verse 37, he says, When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Are you part of that everyone? I know many of you are saved and spirit-filled. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about that one who just so happened to have tuned in because someone told you, tune into this broadcast. Are you between two opinions? You know, maybe you believe because your mama told you about Jesus and that you should go to church, or maybe your uncle uh, told you, or maybe, you know, a, a co-worker. Somebody gave you a track, you know, but you need Jesus. Are you seeking him? If you seek him, you'll find him. When you really make up your mind to seek him, you will find him because that's his desire that you might be in fellowship with him. That's why he came. And so Simon says, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go to the next town, that is, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Jesus, the circuit preacher. Way back in the day when my parents were growing up in Louisiana, there were some areas that were so sparsely populated that they didn't have a, a pastor per se. They had a circuit preacher that passed through the areas. And maybe he preached at their church on the first Sunday. And he might have preached at the other church down the road on the second Sunday. And as he made his way through, uh, they got a word. It might have been once a month, but that was simply because of the nature of the sparsity and the population. But they still got a word. And we're seeing here the Lord Jesus Christ going around from city, from town to town, to hamlet to hamlet, preaching the gospel. He's on a mission, I tell you, saints. He's on a tight timeline, three and a half years, to get the gospel message out. And we, too, are on a timeline, because we don't know when the Lord will crack the sky. But I sure enough believe the time and the day and time is drawing nigh. Are you ready? Because when he comes back, you won't have time to get ready. This is the time to be ready. Are you ready? You need to adopt the saying, ever ready ever ready and desirous of the coming of the king. Jesus said, this is the purpose why I came. i got to go and preach the gospel. Verse 39, and he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. I tell you, here he is. He said, I'm doing some house cleaning. I'm purging. I'm casting out some demons because I'm trying to get you ready for when I come back the second time for my bride. And now the, this chapter transitions to uh, the closing six verses where we have seen the Lord Jesus Christ healing the sick and the lame and the paralytic and opening blind eyes and unstopping deaf ears and loosing the muted tongue and casting out demons. But now as he closes out uh, this particular module, we see a leper come on the scene. And a leper is one who is a type of sin. Leprosy is always seen in the scripture as a type of sin. And it's deadly. It's destructive. It causes the body to decay. And, and, and just think about this. The power. That's what God is saying. He's saying when, uh, when lust is conceived, it brings about sin. And when sin is, is brought forth, it brings about death. 
And so the Bible uses it as a symbol, a metaphor of the destructive nature, the destructive nature of sin. Oh, man. I want you to hear my heart. You know, this man was fully engulfed in sin. That's what this is a picture of. That he's a leper. And, and as such, in, in this region of Palestine, in this area, it was required of them when they're out in the public to go about saying, unclean, unclean, unclean. Oh, can you imagine you being required when you're out and about to be covered and tend to declare to those who have not contaminated with such sins as yourself to declare unclean, unclean, unclean. Oh my God, I need you to hear me now because yeah, yes, 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 the devil's trying to tell you that Jesus can't cleanse you. The devil's trying to tell you that you can't be saved. Oh, but the devil is a liar. Oh, Jesus can do the impossible. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Mm. Mm. My, 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 my. And so we now see a leper. There's another story in the gospel where 10 lepers came to the Lord Jesus Christ, crying out, Jesus, have mercy on us. And he cleansed all 10 of them. And they went away rejoicing. But only one turned back, and he was a Samaritan. And he came back saying, thank you, falling out of Jesus. Thank you uh, for having given me an opportunity to get my life right. And our God is a God of another chance. I'm not going to limit him by saying he's the God of a second chance. I know for certain, because I'm speaking of my own life experience, that he has given me countless chances. I'm so glad I've lost count of the chances, and I'm so thankful for the blood of Jesus, which still has power to cleanse, and the word of God, which still has power to wash away my sins. But yes, Lord, he said, though my sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. If I'm willing and obedient, I should eat the good of the land. That's Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Oh, I tell you, God is good. You don't have to stay in that situation. You can be free from the bondage of those sins. For Jesus died so that you and I could be free to praise him, free to serve him, and free from the judgment and wrath to come. Oh, I hope you're hearing me. I hope you respond to this calling. <clears throat> and so this leper comes. Verse 40. He says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Mm. Did you see this picture? That's a humble position. He's coming unto the only one that can make a difference in his life. He's coming because he's heard, has this been noise abroad? Oh yes, it's been noise because Jesus is going from city to city. We saw that in, uh, in Galilee, in Capernaum, where at Peter's house that they waited all night to get uh, just a touch or just get a word. And so he's heard word that there's a miracle worker. He's heard a word that there's a man from God that's come and he's raising the dead, he's opening blind eyes, and he's performing all kinds of miracles. And maybe, perhaps, it's possible that he might have compassion upon me. He might be moved with compassion upon a wretch like me and heal me of this leprosy. And so the leper comes to Jesus. And he says, if you are willing, oh, I want you to see the humility of this cry. And, but he comes... At the same time, he's imploring him. He's, he's, Lord, Lord, if you will, please, please, please. Oh, have mercy. Please. <clears throat> and kneeling. I want you to see this picture. He didn't come with sort of a proudness. No, no. When you cover the sin, no, you recognize that you toe up from the floor. But you recognize that Jesus is able. Our God is able. He's a compassionate God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever shall believe on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, that leper got that word, and he came seeking Jesus for a healing. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moves with compassion, stretched out his hand, and touched him, and said unto him, I am willing to be cleansed. Now, this is significant as far as the order of things. Because uh, Jesus is anointed to operate as a prophet, as a priest, and as the king. And this trifold anointing, it represents the trifold work he's doing. And as uh, the priest and uh, operate within Levitical laws, Jesus did not touch an unclean person. But because of his word, because of what transpired here in verse uh, 
41, by the mere statement, I am willing. In the Greek, it means that the cleansing became manifest right in that moment when Jesus says, I'm willing. Be cleansed. That's when the healing took place. It was manifest. He was immediately healed of the leprosy. That moment. And it is at that point after the cleansing, as soon as he has spoken, that's what the word says, as soon as he has spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And so before Jesus even touched him, he sent forth the word, and that word touched it. And that's what we're doing on this evening, sending forth a word that it might touch you, that you too can be healed of whatever woes you. Because God is able. If you come beseeching him, if you come seeking him, you, can, you too can come boldly unto the throne of grace, that you might obtain mercy and find grace and help in your time of need. For we have not a great high priest who cannot sympathize with our infirmities. Jesus, the Son of God, who is tempted in every point, but yet without sin, he says, you can come boldly up to the throne of grace that you can obtain mercy and find grace and help in your time of need. I don't know about you, but this is truly a great time of need, uh, great needs during this season of corona, uh, this year of 2020. There are many needs, but our God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You call him, you come to him, you come boldly, recognize it, and this boldness means you don't have to worry about dying, but you do, so I suggest, come humbly. Amen. Then Jesus moved with compassion. Do you see this word? Move with compassion. That's that agape love, which is, which is Jesus, which is God. For God is love. And, and so in seeing this leper, the Lord Jesus Christ says, move with compassion. Mm. And stretched out his hand and touched him and saying to him, I am willing to be cleansed. So the order of things, he said, be cleansed and touched. Amen. In verse 42, as soon as he has spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Dip into the blood and you too come clean. Ah, I love it. Whatever the Holy Spirit has told you on this evening, come clean. The blood of Jesus, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be made white as snow if you desire to come clean. If you're willing and obedient, you too be made clean. Verse 43. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. Though Mark's gospel is compact, it uses some powerful words. And this uh, charge that the Lord Jesus Christ is a firm. It's like in your face. Look at here. Now you go and show yourself unto the Levites. Uh, for evidence of your cleansing and purification. And he said, now, don't you do anything else. You go. He strictly warned him and sent him away. Now, he was sent uh, at once. Amen? But let's see in verse 44. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. As I was saying, Jesus operated in his priesthood, Levitical role. And he said, now I want you to validate this in keeping the law. Go show yourself so that the uh, priest can declare you clean. And let's see how the leper responded. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in the deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. It's no wonder the fellow was a leper, full of sin. He could not keep, he could not be obedient with one moment. He was strictly charged. And I remember the Lord Jesus Christ healed a man who had laid at the uh, Bethesda pool for 38 years and Jesus said get up and, and take your bed and walk and he found that man later on in the temple and said you go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you and we see that the Lord didn't play no games he warned this fellow and don't you go about uh, uh, broadcasting this thing but here in the gospel what it says here, he went broadcasting I mean it's like he got a megaphone and got to say hey look at me y'all I'm the one that was a leper 
I'm the one that used to be saying, unclean, unclean. Look at me. And he messed it up. The Lord Jesus Christ had sternly warned him, don't you be broadcasting. And the reason being, Jesus didn't want additional attention brought upon his ministry. Not at this point. As he knew that the Pharisees, the scribes, and the elders were going to be hating on him and trying to kill him. And as you can see from the text, he couldn't do more, many works in the cities for the very reason he said, I'm going from town to town to preach the kingdom of God. And yet, this disobedient leper went away, having been cleansed, and started broadcasting and proclaiming. And as a result of his disobedience, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in the deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. So it didn't stop the people from coming. But I wonder, I just wonder, you know, I ain't going to add to the scripture, but I wonder the status of that leper, the one that's clean. I wonder. Because we're not saying he was saved. What we're saying here in the scripture is he got healed. There's a difference. The Lord Jesus Christ can heal you. But his main mission, saints and ain'ts, is your salvation. So as I prepare to close, it is my prayer and it's my desire because it is the desire of who I represent, the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, that you will not squander this opportunity for you know not what tomorrow holds, but that you would use this opportunity to pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood because I believe that you died on the cross and that you were buried. And on the third day, God the Father raised you from the dead and right now, Lord Jesus, I open the door to my heart and I receive you into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then, Lord, grow me. Draw me near. Open my eyes that I might see, my ears that I might hear, and my heart that I might receive your Holy Spirit and grow in grace and knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me uh, and you meant it from your heart, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ is dwelling in your heart. And I just want to declare happy birthday, but that's just the beginning. Please, 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 young man, young lady, mother, father, please reach out to us. The information is on your screen and, and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I pray that you've been blessed. And I'm Elder Marvin Kelly here at the Well Community Church. Thank you, and God bless you.